We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Welcome to the Italian Grand Prix recap. Uh, we had a, a race. It was very exciting. It was also very dry for the first time since April. Um, but, you know, for all the people who are like complaining like, oh, uh, dry races are so boring. I thought this was actually a really good, really exciting race. Um, we had a lot of competition all the way down, all, all 19 positions. We'll get to why there wasn't 20 in a, mil- in a minute. Um, but yeah, I, th- I just thought it was, it was really good. There were a ton of penalties being thrown out. Some we saw, some we didn't. Um, and a lot of excitement toward the top half of the field that we haven't really seen at all this season, right? Yeah, I'd say it was definitely a more competitive race than we've seen all season for sure. And that made it more exciting. For those of you who are like, well, Zandvoort was way more exciting. Lots more going on last weekend at the Dutch GP. I tend to agree with you. However, the competition for, you know, the podium this weekend, I think was a lot more exciting. But that's just me personally. But with that, let's get into our 60 second recap of the Italian Grand Prix. Yuki's car failure led to a rare abandoned start and a red flag to start the race. Carlos Sainz had to defend for every single one of the 51 laps and completely stole the show driving this weekend. Uh, We think that Charles Leclerc does not know the uh, definition of no risk. The podium for this GP was Max Verstappen P1, Sergio Perez P2, and Carlos Sainz P3. Which means that Max Verstappen has indeed broken Sebastian Vettel's consecutive wins record with his 10th win in a row. Yes, so that is our quick, quick recap of the Italian Grand Prix for you. Obviously, we're going to go into more detail in a bit, but just to highlight what we thought were the the big items for this weekend. And of course, we can't really start a podcast without (laughs) talking about the obligatory Lewis Hamilton contract update, which we actually have. So as you guys probably saw or maybe heard, Lewis has signed with Mercedes through 2025 as expected. We talked a little bit about our speculation and our thoughts on this in our Italian Grand Prix prediction podcast last week thinking he would stay through 2025 just with the regulation change that made sense and they also came out and announced they extended George through 2025 as well we did not expect them to you know extend or do that for George to extend him through 2025 but it just makes sense to keep both drivers through the same year so little uh you know Lewis Hamilton contract update news I'm a little sad that this is going away because I don't, it's yeah. not like we're going to keep talking about this. And we have nothing at the top of the pod, but I'm sure we'll find something else to talk about. Um, yeah, I just also want to add that I, it, it, it makes sense that they decided to, you know, kill two birds with one stone to, to you know, extend both of their contracts, even though George's wasn't up until next year. Um, and, you know, it knocks it out and gives the uh, contract team um, for both sides, or all three sides in this case, one less thing that they have to worry about for, for you know, a minute. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So congratulations, Lewis and George. You're going to get a lot of money and have a seat for two more years. So. Yep. Pretty much. And we're done with that. <laughs> yes. And on. what else are we what else are we done with is we are saying goodbye to European racing for this season. We we have had our last European based motor race. And I know Catherine is kind of excited because that means better start times for her. No more three o'clock, yeah. four o'clock wake up calls for her. I personally don't mind them sitting in Argentina. The last few have been 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning, which is perfect race times. I'm a little excited to move to better F, uh, FP1 to start times, quality yes. times. Um, yeah. We all know that I don't love uh, Suzuka or, um, j- sorry, Japan Singapore and Singapore either. because they're really, really at an inconvenient time for me. It's like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. I'd love it to be like 11 p.m., 12 p.m., but 
it's well, it's you were in my side of the of the planet. I know, I know. Give me, you know, ten months and we'll be there. But, uh, but yeah. So looking forward to different race times. The one that I'm really not looking forward to is Las Vegas because that's gonna here, be hard for you. It's gonna be really hard for me. It's I think it's at like 11 p.m. or something crazy like that. And the reason why is because they have to do that for the European fans because that's where the major fan base is. It's also on the Vegas Strip at night. So they have to, yeah. you know, a lot of logistics around that. But it should be interesting. I'm excited. So, yep, we move to Asia next. And then we go to the Americas and we finish the season in the Middle East. So looking forward to... Do that. I know. I'm actually excited to, you know, have different race times and yeah. just see the rest of the season. I don't know. I get, I like, I love the European races, but I feel like I like some variety. I don't know. I, just, I feel like they're all kind of the same. But. I don't know. I just really like to sleep. Uh, like, I will admit that after uh, today's race, I took a nap for, for about an hour and a half because if not, I would have not have, like, made it through the day. I would not be this bright-eyed for this podcast. Um, and, yeah, I just, you know, I, I get into I have my I have my routines, and, and my routines include getting, like, a full number of hours of sleep. And it's not – I couldn't go to bed early last night because UCLA football was playing, and I had to watch, you know, the end of that game because it was – Oh, it's going to be a long football season. That's all I'm going to say. I know. I know. But anyways, that's it for kind of our admin news updates. (laughs) But going into kind of our full, full recap for the entire weekend in Monza, starting with practices in Quali. I have nothing of note. (laughs) Um, All the free practices were pretty boring. Nothing, you know, crazy happened. Qualifying was a little exciting, you know, of course, towards the end, except Crofty got like so animated with like seven minutes left to go qualifying. And I wasn't like paying attention to the clock. I'm just like watching the racing and kind of paying attention to the clock as well, but not like keeping my eye on it. And I'm hearing him and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is where this is it. This is the last, you know, minute and everything's gonna go crazy and we have seven minutes left I'm like Crofty you can't do this to me I, I yeah, have anxiety like, the way it is take another lap it's it's or not two gonna, yeah, like, yeah exa- just, exactly like they pump he, the brakes he, he really he got very excited about it well I mean obviously you know second race back from the summer break he's just really really into it um but yeah I just it it was it was very that was very interesting to like look at the clock and see that there were like six and a half minutes to go in that last session um and I'm like okay okay any and we'll have this all and then the end of what uh sorry the end of qualifying was actually really exciting um super exciting yeah like the margins from p1 to p3 was like six thousandths of a second it was all very very close well and the way that it happened too because leclerc crossed and it was like oh provisional pull and everyone went crazy because you have to remember monza is a huge, huge crowd for Ferrari. It's in Italy. Yep. This is their home race, and they love Ferrari in Monza. It was actually really, really cool to see. Um, so Leclerc crossed. He had provisional pole. Everyone went berserk. And then Max crosses like a few seconds later, and then he had provisional pole. And everyone was like, oh, oh here we go again. There's this huge <laughs> sigh over the crowd. <laughs> And then Carlos comes in after Max, and it was like, oh, now he has pull. And everyone went crazy. Like, it was really cool to see. The crowd was so, so loud. They were trying to interview them after qualifying, and you couldn't even hear anything that was happening because the crowd was so loud. That was the only thing that came out of Friday or Saturday of note was that Carlos drove amazing. Carlos looked so good driving he really did all yeah. weekend long like this was the best driving I've seen from Carlos all year I think but yeah and I, I also me. think that this is the first time that he's really had the opportunity to be fast in this Ferrari because you know basically every other time he's you know either way you know it, out of position or he's behind Charles and Ferrari is you know he's their golden child so they're going to um always you know try to put him ahead um so this was really the first opportunity this season to see just how fast and just how good Carlos is and, and then of course he gets the 
this big, big, you know, emotional boost from being in front of all the Tifosi and, you know, being in Italy at, at his home, you know, his team's home race. Um, so I think that, you know, this was a really great opportunity, even though he didn't win the race, um, to, to really show just how good of a racer he is. No, he is. And just how good of a defender he is, which we'll talk oh, about yeah. in a little bit. But, oh, my gosh, can that guy defend? Like, Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, his life depends on it. Um, yeah. But, yeah, we'll keep talking about Carlos later because he's just so amazing. And we'll talk about the, the podium here in a bit. But Friday and Saturday, nothing really happened. Then going into Sunday for a race, we attempt to start. And we don't. So we had an abandoned start. So, Catherine, what's an abandoned start, first of all, to kind of help out the crowd here? Basically, an abandoned start is when, after the formation lap, there is something that happens that does not allow you to start the race. And, you know, mostly this is a car that is either not able to get off the blocks or this is a car that had to pull over on track and was not able to be removed in a safe manner before the lights went out. Um, and that is something that, you know, you don't see it very often. The last time we actually had an aborted start was at Spa in 2021. Um, they had to basically um, red flag the, the start of the race. They put everybody back on the grid um, to take time to get Yuki's car off the track. Um, and then um, they had to redo the formation lap, which cut a lap off of the t- final total. Um, and the duration of the race went from 53 laps to 51 laps because they had to do a second formation lap as well. Yeah, exactly. So whenever cars fuel up, they fuel it exactly perfectly so they can do formation lap, the number of laps for the race, and then have a small sample for the FIA to test the fuel after the race so it's not like they could do their formation lap and then sit there they have to do another formation lap and they need to be able to still have a sample they can't refuel the cars so they did have to cut the race down from 53 laps to 51 laps so it's it's a little interesting how like technical all of these things are so yeah they are um, they're very much primed for just that amount of racing um but what's also really interesting is this is not the first time yuki has dns did not started at monza um this did is not his started. second time <laughs> did, did not started um which is totally not the the uh perm- i think we're coining a new term here i think we're coining a new term did not started <laughs> did not start it. Um, no, he, he also DNS, um, at Monza in 2021. So two years ago. Um, and then he also DNS before the Saudi Arabia race in 2022, which was the second race of the season. So he, he has, he has now met his apparently obligatory one DNS per season mark. Poor Yuki. Man. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was really, that, that was really tough for him. Yeah, this is a race two out of two for Lawson finishing above Yuki now. <laughs> also that, yeah. I mean, this one, it's like a softball. He could have come in 19th and still would have finished above Yuki because he DNS'd. But um, but he didn't come in 19th. And we'll talk about where Lawson finished in a bit. Yeah. But like... Lawson is not a bad super sub to have in, in the car. Well, I'll, say, I'll say that. He's been very solid. When it sounds like he's kind of like reached out to Danny too and talked to him and Danny's been really supportive and like helping him and which is really cool. I can't speak more highly of Danny. He seems like a really cool guy to to have in your in your uh corner team corner. I don't know car analogy to use, but yeah, it sounds like a good person to have in your corner in general. So <sighs> but anyways, moving to my most depressing piece of the weekend. <laughs> the Monza curse is broken. Which the Monza like curse is broken. Everyone under the sun probably could have guessed. Catherine was banking on. She was laughing at me for anticipating the Monza curse would continue. But Max did overcome the Monza curse to win for the second time in a row. He broke the record for the 10th consecutive win. The Red Bull team stretched their team record to, 10, to 15 straight. Blah, 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 blah. As Toto Wolf would put it, this is all for the Wikipedia page and no one cares about (laughs) these records, which I thought is just the highlight, 
highlight quote of the year. I'm going to put that on my like highlight quotes that I'm keeping track of because so good. Like you can tell he's so frustrated and he's like, it's all for Wikipedia. No one cares about these. But if it, the shoe was on the other foot, he'd be like, blowing it up and so oh, excited yeah so. exactly this would this would be the only thing that they would be ever talk about ever um yeah. but to be fair max did actually have to fight for this like it was he did because he did not start like, on immediate pole. yeah because no. if you remember I mean, he got he's, he was starting in second carlos had pole yes. and carlos led for 15 laps and defended so well out of his mind defended out of his mind defended but then Max got close, and because he was defending so well, his rears were just gone. And Max yeah, was, like, making jokes about it the entire time on the team radio, yeah. too. He's like, oh, his rears are sliding. Like, he's he's toast. Like, this is, we're fine. Everything's good. And like, then he's just like, please be patient, Max. Like, like be, be si- like, I think he said, like, be sensible at one point. And I'm just like, Max and G. Do you know who I you're talking to? So like, much. this is Max. We're not going to be sensible. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I don't think he, he knows the definition. On, no, just like Leclerc doesn't know the definition of risk, so. Nope, nope. Someone get these boys a dictionary. Um, but yeah, so passed him on lap 15 and then just drove into the sunset. Pretty soon he was lapping Mags, so it was, you know, just. Well, he K-Mags was the only one he did end up lapping, um, which the, um, Max mentioned in the post-race interview on the track that they were dealing with a small issue. Didn't say what that issue was, which it could have been like he was just, you know, I don't know, maybe his foot was cramping. I don't know what the issue actually was, um, but he, he did end up backing off. Um, so he, you know, could have probably won by even more of a distance had there not been whatever issue was going on in the car. Um, but I personally think that, you know, the team definitely sacrificed a little bit of qualifying speed um, in order to have more race pace on Sunday. Not to say that I don't think that Carlos beat him fair and square for, you know, in qualifying for pole. Um, but I do think that Max was way too calm about fin- about starting that race P2 um, to not have something in his pocket for Sunday, which clearly we did see. Well, yeah, I mean, we all just know that I mean, I think the thing that he had in his back pocket was the fact that Ferrari will mess something up. And we, although they, they had a pretty clean race, and I would say their strategy, you know, Ferrari did not do as horribly as we were all expecting. Let's just say that. No, they, they their, their car just didn't. isn't as fast, and we all know that. So, like, yeah, Carlos may have out drove him for one lap in quali, but he can't do it for 51 or 50, 53, you know, laps at in the race so yeah I mean it's definitely they they their car eats up their tires so much more than um you know the Red Bull cars and that will significantly decrease your pace and that's just that's you know not something that they've been able to rectify in their car yeah because if so what Kevin is saying there is it eats up your tires so you're you get a lot of tire degradation such a hard word to say and you lose your grip on your tires, and so you'll slide around more. You your break your braking's affected, your acceleration's affected by your tires, um, and you lose your grip. So going around corners, you can slide, and that slows you down. So you have to be more cautious when you drive when you have higher tire degradation. So certain cars are able to help you manage your tire degradation. I'm probably butchering. I can't pronounce this word. It's such a hard word to say. But certain cars help you manage that better than others. Ferraris is horrible than and like Red Bulls is better. So that's what we're talking about. But yeah, I digress. Yeah. Um, And then moving on to P2, this was actually Sergio Perez's third podium in four races. Um, He finally made it back to that podium after getting the penalty last week. Um, um, and yeah, he, he managed to, to finish P2, um, which I think looked pretty inevitable once he managed to get past Charles Leclerc. Um, but he took so long to overtake. Like he, I don't know what, I, actually I kind of do know what it is, um, but he just, there are some times where he just struggles so much with overtaking cars that should not take this long to overtake. No. 
It, it almost looks like he's not super, super comfy in the car. And, like, we all know this car is built for Max. Not. It's not built for Checo. And so, yeah, and he's not comfortable in the car. And, like, he's, you know, he brakes earlier and he's not... He's, it's almost like he's fighting with the car, not working with the car. And I think you, exactly. we were talking about that earlier. Yeah. And so, and if you watch, like, him trying to pass Charles and Carlos, especially going into the first chicane, they both break so much later than Checo, which helps them, you know, keep maintain defending position. him and maintain position. Yeah. So, I don't know. He just has yeah. some things going on with well, this car, but... What what was really interesting for for me is I was watching the post race show and he mentioned in the media pen that there wasn't a lot of benefit from DRS at Monza, which there wasn't a lot of DRS at Monza, but it really no. makes me think that he is being too reliant on the Red Bull car's overall pace, that he's really struggling with actually figuring out how to master the car and how to make the car work with him the same way Max does. And obviously by this point in the season, this the cars are really being tuned toward what works more for Max. And Sergio Perez is just really struggling with how to make that work for him as well, which is why he ne doesn't necessarily have that same quality speed. Um, and that's why it's like, oh my God, there's like a second and a half between cars or, or whatever. whatever. Um, but I think that, you know, his, his race pace does ultimately allow him to continue staying in the, in the positions that Red Bull expects to see him in. Um, but that he does really also need to be a little bit less reliant on DRS especially on tracks where DRS is not as beneficial as it is on others. Yeah, I mean, this all goes back to the argument, like, how much of it is the car, how much of it is the driver. Like, if you have this same identical car, one driver should not be beating the other driver by, you know, 7, 8 seconds, 25 seconds every race. And, like, yeah, yeah one might have to work through traffic, but still you should, like, it shouldn't be as big of a gap as it is. So it's, I feel like of all the drivers, he's one that is very, very reliant on the DRS and the car and is not like trying to be the driver and like bring that, I don't know how to explain that. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it totally does. He's just, he's, he's very, he, the, the moral of the story is he's struggling to master the car. Um, he's making, you know, he, he's really working really hard to make it work for him. Um, he's almost and, like an autopilot. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. he's like, this car is really good. So I'm just going to like hit that autopilot and cruise because I know like at least somewhere I'll be in the points. So yeah, which is is not really what Red Bull wants out of their number two driver. Um, they no. they really want you know somebody who is you know expected to be P two every race behind Max. I love how it's just expected to be P two because it's not P one because Max is P one. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, that's 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 Max. Um, yeah. But speaking of P three, which was a phenomenal battle, um, was Carlos. Uh, he made speaking it. Of, speaking of uh, your number two driver. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Emily made it funny. Uh, Carlos drove so good all weekend long, and especially today on Sunday. And he deserved every single piece of this P3. And I can't believe that Charles almost took it from him in, like, the last four laps. Like, Ferrari was letting them race. The entire time they told Charles like don't we don't need any risk here like please keep it no risk and then Charles is still trying to pass him and like locks up on lap 51 and almost goes into Carlos and almost takes out both of them and it's like that would be considered a risk why are you trying to pass him like yeah. stop I know you both want to be on the podium but just pump the brakes and Carlos was driving so much better than Charles, but because he was defending for every single lap, again, his rear tires were starting to go. Char uh, Charles Leclerc did not have to defend as much, so his tires were in better shape, so he was going faster than Carlos. But it still gave me so much anxiety, yeah. and it was just, like, driving me absolutely insane. But I'm really glad that 
he at least made the podium. It was really, really big for the fans, too. It was really exciting. And he was in P2 until lap 46, which is amazing. He lost in the last five laps, which really, really sucks. Yeah. But he held on for a really, really long time. I honestly didn't think that either Ferraris were going to hold on to where they ended up, but they did, so... Yeah, well, I think it it got to a point where George was basically running in no man's land behind them, and there was there was no one um, like in in order for them to have like a different, you know, a non Ferrari um, P three, it would have had to have been a double DNF sort of situation, Um, but like it was. Ferrari gave the Ferrari fans the show of their lives at Monza, which was very scary and very stressful, but also phenomenal. Like that's you like you want your drivers to be competitive and you want them to be, you know, racing for, you know, everybody wants to be on a podium, especially the podium at Monza. Um, yeah, but I think it also got a little bit too close, too, too close. I think it got a little too close for comfort. Just personal opinions, not because I really, you know, am a big Carlos fan, because I also like Charles, just love Ferrari in general. I thought this was a much better showing for them than recent races, and I'm really glad that it was in Monza. Um, They needed, they need a little bit of a a boost. Um, Maybe we can all stop, you know, shitting on Ferrari now. Probably not. It was just one race, but we're moving in a positive direction. Um... But yeah, the the whole Leclerc of it all was just wild to me. They literally came on the radio and they're like, okay, thank you for, you know, the racing, but let's have no risk. Yeah. And he just is like, okay, cool. So that means I'm going to try and pass Carlos. I'm going to dive bomb my teammate now. Every single lap until the end of the race. And yeah, it's just like. I just can't. Yeah. I an, another one of those um post race show moments. Um Fred Vassar was being interviewed um and Laura Winter, I love Fred. Just love him like, too. His humor is so great and like his candor yeah. and just so just deadpan is my favorite. It's it's He's am- so great. it's truly amazing and truly underrated on track. Um but so Laura underrated. Winter asked him about that late battle. Um and he said the definition of no risk is relative. Um which was just hilarious. And then he also did kind of mention that they would talk about that in debrief. So I think Charles might get a little bit of a slap on the wrist there. Um but also like it could have been communicated to him better. Like say, hey, we're not fighting. Hey, we're not racing. Well, I don't Hold know if position. you can say that in in that type of race situation or like Charles is just gonna say like screw off I'm gonna do what I want um and then Charles like the, actually <laughs> Valtteri this is James <laughs> like that that is my favorite radio call ever ever um I mean but still you can say like this is too risky we don't need a double DNF just hold position yeah and I feel like that he he would understand well, I, would, I do but... personally think that Charles should have backed off on lap 51. He definitely should oh, have. Oh, on lap 51, yeah. Like, let's, okay, he was passed in lap 46. So in lap 46, you were in P3 and P4. Mm-hmm. So 47, 48, 49, even 50 maybe. Yeah. I'd probably cut it at 49. Like, go for it. You're trying, whatever. But the last lap... Give it a rest, Charles. You're not making podium. Yeah. <laughs> Pump and then the brakes. Charles walked up to, to Fred and he put his hand on his on his neck and was like, how's your heart rate? Which was the funniest little moment. So obviously, like, they're all, like, fine with it. But there's definitely going to be a please don't put the cars at risk and, and put a, the team at risk of a double DNF next time. Maybe. Just a thought. Maybe. Perhaps. <sighs> Jesus. Yeah. I, yeah. That... That was the numb of the weekend was Charles still racing until the very last lap and potentially causing a double DNF, but... I think it's the potentially causing a double DNF portion of that that is the the real dumb of the week, um, more yeah. more than, than the, you know, trying to, to race and be competitive, because, like, the, these are all very competitive people who are all working very hard to be as close to the top of the field as possible, and especially if you have a situation where Max takes P1 every race, then you only have two other podium positions available. Exactly. 
Exactly. So speaking of podium positions, my mm. potential. P3 Everyone's potential P three. If, if we want to be honest, I know. Which also, I want to yes, because other people picked Alex Albon to get P three, not just me. I have I a lot of confidence in him. Exactly. And this Williams car, and it. Mm, it's okay. I shouldn't have laughed. I mean, it's not okay, but it is. No, you shouldn't have, (laughs) and I'm very offended, but it's fine. Um, But no, he he did manage to drive pretty well. He defended against the McLarens uh, for a really long time. But yeah, he was kind of like brains out. Yeah, he did. He had a really early pit stop. Uh, He pitted in lap 15. And went from mediums to hards and had to go the rest of the race on hards. So he kind of gambled there. Had, you know, a, I don't know. I, di- I didn't, but again, it was nothing like mentionable because everything in the broadcast and the, my whole attention was on Carlos defending against Max. And oh my gosh, like that now he's defending against Checo, but also Leclerc is trying to pass Checo and then you had a few other people in the mix, but the whole race was Carlos. Like, that yeah. was the whole race. And so I even forgot about Alex because of that. Yeah, so, it was it was a, it was was an, an Alex, Lando, Oscar, Lewis train, pretty much. Um, and, like, the, he... I, I don't know how Alex managed to, to hold off. Like, I, okay, I do, because even, you know, Lando was honest pretty much all weekend that, you know... They didn't really have a lot of overall confidence in their low downforce package, and this is a very low downforce track. Um, so I can see why Alex was able to successfully do that. Like he um, managed to be just fast enough on the straights that you have at Monza to be able to hold off a McLaren like Lando's. Um, and then at the end of the race, Alex's engineer says, I think we can add Norris to the list of people who hate the sight of our rear wing. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's good to see them progressing though. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah, it's and it's not like oh, one race he did really well, and then you know he's back in, you know, P fifteen and down. It's he does well every every race, so he didn't make podium, but he still had a good a good weekend. Yeah, so. he's 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 getting to the point where you can almost consistently expect Alex to be um a a point scorer, which is what Williams has been dying for for years now. Yeah. Yeah, which is exciting. Yeah, so. it's really exciting. So other things happening this weekend on the track. This was a this was a surprise one. Yeah. Botas finished in the points. Yeah. He's back. He yeah, he landed in P10, which you know, we'll talk about our predictions a little bit later, mm-hmm. but uh, yes. those didn't go well. Uh, so he landed in P10, which is the first points for Alfa Romeo since Canada, which was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, that that's um, insane. Yeah. So, and again, like I said, I didn't even realize where he was during the race because the entire race was just between P1 and P4 four basically p5 yeah, pretty much. Um, and the rest of it like yeah there was i was kind of keeping an eye on it but the exciting piece was really at the front so 100 percent. um which normally it's not because normally it's just like max is off and then sometimes fernando is off or sometimes checo is off and then it's like we're all excited for you know p6 through 10 because that's where the fighting is so i don't know and but at least it was, was a really top. competitive race exactly we're back the, and all order is restored in the universe. Exactly. Um, but another notable finish was Liam Lawson. Like we kind of mentioned earlier, he finished above Yuki. He ended up in P11, so he didn't get points, but he was close. And again, this is only his second uh, Formula One race. In a bad and car. And it's his first race. <laughs> in a bad car. And it's his first, like, full dry experience yeah uh so i think p11 is is pretty good for him so. Ab- absolutely and then I'll, I'll let you take this next one because this this was your your fa- one of your favorite moments of of today <laughs> so one of my fa- you guys will get to know me and one of my favorite things about formula one is the radio calls yes, and yes. team radios i'm obsessed they are great someone that is just providing some amazing content for us this year is George. So George Russell, (laughs) (laughs) it just in general, but this race especially. So his, 
engineer came on and said, George, you need to work more on your tire management in turn six. And this was early on in the race. And he just screams back, I don't know if you see it or not, but I have a car up my ass right now. (laughs) And I died because this is when Checo was behind him trying to pass him. And George was like trying to defend and just clearly not keeping track of his tires because he was just focusing on defending um, Checo. This was like lap six too. Yeah, it was lap six, and he's like, and they're like, yeah, buddy, like, really work on the tire management, and he's like, I have a car up my ass, do you see this? <laughs> but I thought it was great, and I thought we needed to talk about it, because George has really been coming in clutch with the uh, the commentary this year. Quality so. radio calls, definitely. Quality radio calls, for sure. So, and then we have our, like, mystery, mysterious mystery retirement from Alcon in mm-hmm. lap 46, so all of a sudden, he's just we're out. He's just and, out, and Alcon's just out. He's just like, he's Bye. just done. Um, yeah, but thanks to Catherine's investigative journalism skills, uh, it was because of a steering lockup, steering issue. Yeah, he steering um, lockup issue. Yeah, we we had no idea. Like they they barely mentioned it on the broadcast and then I was like I was looking at like the Alpine Twitter and all they were saying was you know tough to see a race end like this and it was a picture of Akon's back on his way to the media pen um and then I took my nap and I woke up from my nap and then I saw that um Formula One's YouTube channel had released the final radio calls so I listened to that and all it's and all his engineer said was um back off at turn eight and then come into the pit and retire the car um and we'll talk about why offline and then finally I caught um the clip of everybody's post-race reactions in the media pen and Akon said that there was some steering lockup issues that were only getting worse so they had to retire him for safety reasons so mystery solved yep and for all those Wondering where Gasly finished, because I know after last week, we're all concerned about Gasly. Uh, he finished P15. Yeah, <laughs> so. Alpine didn't have a great week. Alpine did not have a good weekend. No, not at all. At all. Yeah, qualifying definitely didn't help because this is a place that's really tough to, to overtake. Um, but yeah, it was it was a very anonymous, anonymous weekend for them both. And one other thing I want to touch on, Kevin, because I know we talked about it a little bit in our predictions podcast, is the alternate tire allocation. So again, for those of you who are not aware of this, it's when the FIA tells the teams basically instead of 13 sets of tires, you go to 11, and we're also mandating which tires you can use for qualifying. So Q1 is hards, Q2 is mediums, Q3 Three is softs. softs, and they have to use them Normally, you can kind of switch it up and change tires. Uh, They can change tires, but it has to be the same, so it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to use two sets of the same um, compound. So, and also because they're down two sets of tires as well. So, which is an environmental thing. It is an environmental thing. Yes. So, what are your thoughts after seeing another race? Because this is our second race of the year. It's supposed to be the third, but again, Imola was. Canceled. indefinitely postponed slash canceled um so Imola was one of those races but we obviously didn't have it so this is the second race of the season with this alternate tire allocation format what are your thoughts after seeing another race like this um, honestly, I don't mind the, the going from 13 to 11. Obviously, as a fan, it impacts me significantly less than, say, a strategist or a race engineer because they're the ones who have to figure out how to stretch 11 tires for an entire weekend. Um, but the one thing that I, I decided that I'm really not a fan of is mandating um, tire um, a, a tire type for one of the, quali- you know, the qualifying sessions. I, um, I, I was listening to Logan Sargent um, talking about it and you know he said that qualifying really tripped him up in his car because he wasn't really getting a good handle on those mediums um, and had he had an opportunity to say run a set of softs in Q2 who knows Logan could have made it to Q3 and so I think that it's 
you know, unnecessarily hampering um, drivers from, you know, putting their po- full potential in the car during qualifying. Um, and, and I, as I said in, in the predictions video when I was talking about it, sometimes like Pirelli doesn't get the tire selections right. And sometimes, you know, the, the compounds just don't work very well for the track, even on one lap. Um, and I don't think that's another thing that we should be risking thinking about strategy wise. Yeah, I agree. I like that they have to be more strategic going, you know, with two less sets of tires. But yeah, the the qualifying piece just I don't don't love that. So, yeah. Not a fan. Agreed. Yeah. Nope. So, let's talk about how our predictions went. Do we have to? I mean, uh, okay. Yeah. That's fine. We can do this quick cuz it none of it's right, but um, hey, I got a for bit. podium, my podium was Fernando Carlos Alex, which I got Carlos on the podium. I just had him P2 and he ended up P3, so. Yeah, and my podium was yeah. Max, Fernando, and Perez, um, and I flipped where, you know, Perez, I pecked him as P3, he was P2, um, but yeah, and then what, what we really, really got wrong, and we're actually kind of thrilled to get wrong, was pole position, yeah, we both picked Max, and it was Carlos Sainz, which I've never been more excited, thrilled, over the moon, all of the uh, synonyms for excited that I was wrong on this. Yeah. Super, super excited for Carlos. So, um, And then I think we should just put our like P10 predictions to P20 predictions, because yeah. I think that would have been better. Um, I picked Yuki Sonoda, and he did not start, no. so... Yep. Yeah, uh, I picked Kevin Magnuson because just none of us saw Valtteri Botas coming. We we did not expect him to be anywhere near the points because he has not been driving anywhere near the points at all this season. And they also don't show him on the broadcast, like, at all. So how are we to know where he was? <laughs> yeah. Well, at least, you know, the one thing about the broadcast, Red Bull actually got some uh, broadcast time this uh, this weekend because of... Those you know, battles. The fighting and the battles, yeah. So Their Red sponsors, sponsors are going to be very little, happy. A little excited about that, yeah. Oh, but we have Singapore in two weeks. So we had two races back-to-back with you guys. Now we have a week break, and then we are in Singapore. And I know I've been talking about how I just want Max to win in Singapore so he can break another record. So this can just like be his record-breaking year. But it is not mathematically possible for Max to win the title in Singapore. He will have to wait to win the title. Um, I think it's going to be Qatar, which is the race after. Uh, one, one run race after. So it's, gonna, it's Singapore, Suzuka, Qatar. And I think, it's gonna, I think that Max will win it in Qatar. Yeah. So he won't break, th- break that record, but... Again, at this point, I'm, like, just rooting for him to win every single race just so we can wipe this year of racing off of the, <laughs> you know, off the board, asterisk it, whatever you want to Like Toto it. said, it's and just for the Wikipedia page. It's just for the Wikipedia. It's a Wikipedia page year. Um, but, yeah, anyways, that's it for the podcast for this weekend in Monza. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. <laughs>